the scientist JBS Haldane, Samanth Subramanian will join us to talk about his book, A Dominant Character, The Radical Science and Restless Politics of JBS Haldane. What makes the eel such an unusual and misunderstood creature? Patrick Svensson will be here to talk about his international bestseller, The Book of Eels. Plus, our critics will join us for the latest in literary criticism. This is the Book Review Podcast from The New York Times. It's August 21st. I'm Pamela Paul. Joining us now from London is Samanth Subramanian. His new book is called A Dominant Character, The Radical Science and Restless Politics of J.B.S. Haldane. Samanth, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. So the review of this book came in, and all of us who read it were just, and who hadn't read the book yet, were stunned by this story, this 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 really remarkable, and I have to say, kind of crazy story, especially in the upbringing of J.B.S. Haldane, scientist, and were kind of baffled that we had not heard of him. But I understand that certainly in his day, he was a celebrity as far as scientists are celebrities that was who was as big as Einstein in England. Why haven't we heard of him here? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. I mean, I think he lived at a time when a lot of the work that he was doing was quite foundational, his work in genetics and in, in biology. And so as science progresses, you tend to kind of take for granted the scientists who have done the foundational work. Haldane used to say that that's actually the greatest compliment a scientist can ever achieve is for his work to be considered so foundational that it almost seems like a natural sort of law or a law of the universe. You don't even remember the person who came up with it. That's one reason. But I think the second reason is also, to a certain extent, he he was such an ardent leftist and eventually a communist for a for a long period of his life and i think that as the philosophy and the ideology of communism itself lost a certain amount of luster the, the scientists and intellectuals who allied themselves with the cause lost some luster as well so i think his star waned a little because of that but paradoxically as we're rediscovering in this day and age the strengths of certain leftist forms of thinking i believe holden is ripe for rediscovery What are the scientific discoveries or achievements most associated with him? I mean, he he foresaw many things that weren't developed until later, but what did he achieve in his time? You know, as you rightly say, he foresaw the test tube baby. He foresaw peak coal and peak oil. I mean, all these concepts that we're familiar with today in evolutionary biology and in biology itself. I think we might be able to talk about two things. The first that's slightly more complicated is that he he was one of a small group of scientists who used math to wed the legacies of Mendel and Darwin. We all know who Darwin is. Mendel was the was the Czech monk who discovered sort of the units of the gene and who discovered how inheritance works. And for a long time there was a lot of difficulty in figuring out what natural selection had to do with these genetic units that Mendel seemed to have discovered, how it would work, whether natural selection was actually powerful enough to work through the kind of Mendelian inheritance mechanisms that the monk had set up. And I think Haldane and a couple of other people were instrumental in sort of yoking these two strands of biology and genetics together to really revive Darwinism, which in the early 20th century was sort of pretty much on its deathbed because nobody could explain how it worked. And here we are a century later, and Darwinism and Darwinian selection are still sort of the foundational aspects of how life evolves on Earth. So that's one part. And then the second part is something that we all might be familiar with, which is the, the, you know, the notion of how life started on Earth. There are still, even today, plenty of theories for this phenomenon. But the earliest functional theory was put together by Haldane, who envisioned sort of this, quote unquote, primordial soup where you might have a lot of chemicals, a lot of nutrients, and ultraviolet radiation or solar radiation acts on all of these chemicals in just the right way to make sure that the foundational building blocks of life come into being. So I think these are the two sort of pillars of Haldane's legacy, but there's plenty more to discuss as my book makes clear. 
Well, it seems um, preordained or natural that he should become interested in evolutionary biology, considering his own upbringing and, and the impact on him. His father was a scientist. It sounds like he could either have gone completely in the opposite direction, given his childhood experiences with his father, or that he could only have become a scientist. But tell us about his his father and what his upbringing was like, especially with regard to his father's scientific experiments. Biography, the art of biography is so dependent on the biographer and his or her own experiences. I tend to think, for example, that a lot of my life was dictated by what my childhood was like. And I think I might have read that into Haldane's own life story, the fact that his childhood was so unique and so interesting. His father was a scientist who, unlike many other gentleman scientists of his time, believed that science had to benefit sort of the everyday working class person. And so a lot of his science was predicated on that. He would experiment on himself. He would work on easing conditions for coal miners down in coal mines. He would make sure that apartments in low-cost housing in Scotland were better ventilated, schools were better ventilated. I mean, this was really sort of the kind of work that Haldane Sr. did. And very often, JBS, as a boy, would serve sometimes as a guinea pig for his experiments, but almost always as an observer. And I think a lot of that philosophy of doing science, the way in which you treat your own body as a laboratory, the way in which you repurpose science and its principles to make sure that it benefits society at large. I think a lot of that stuck with him throughout his life. Okay, but tell us a little bit exactly what it means to have JBS serve as a kind of guinea pig on the the coal mines, for example. One of the things that his father wanted to work out is why coal miners tend to drop unconscious when they go into particular pockets of mines. And he came up with this idea that there were differing kinds of gases in various parts of coal mines. And in fact, the idea to send a canary down was was his. It was Haldane Sr.'s idea. So that if the canary keeled over before you went anywhere, you knew that there were some dangerous gases afoot. And so one of the anecdotes that I tell in the book is about how young JBS was himself once, you know, they were crawling along a mine near the floor, which is where the oxygen is. And at one point, JBS was told to stand up and recite the funeral oration from Julius Caesar, which he did. And, you know, before he got two sentences in, his head started to swim from all the methane and he sank back down to the floor. And so this was Haldane Sr.'s way of showing JBS that methane floats near the top of the ceiling. And, you know, you could sort of keel over just by breathing it for a few seconds. You know, all of this was regular life for young JBS. The other story I tell, in fact, the one that I open the book with, is a story of what happened when Haldane Sr. was conducting experiments, submarine experiments in a Scottish lake. He put his son into a diving suit, sent him down to the bottom of the lake bed where JBS was happily sort of trundling along until he noticed that the diving suit was too big for him and that water was starting to seep into the suit. And so by the time they pulled him up, I think he was floating in water up to his neck and shivering and he was dozed with whiskey and sort of put to bed. I think that's, you know, that's the sort of the the defining image I have of JBS as one of his father's guinea pigs. Perhaps this is a good time to bring up the family motto. What was it? Suffer. I think it's a great motto. (laughs) I mean, explain. I I mean, beyond those two anecdotes, which probably give us a a somewhat good idea. Well, I mean, I think the motto itself sort of uh, predates both the Haldanes. I mean, I think it's sort of the motto of an old Scottish clan, the Haldane clan, who were themselves half Danes, hence the name. And it's been around for centuries. But I think you're right. I mean, with these two men in particular, and with JBS even more so, I think suffering was very much part and parcel of the way in which they did their work, not only in the sense of using themselves as guinea pigs or or using their bodies as laboratories, but very much in the kind of hard-won knowledge that they took out of all of these experiments. I think suffer seems to point to those experiences quite aptly. All right. It's very clear that you were writing about an unusual character in many respects. And I could stay on the childhood, I feel like, for the next 20 minutes. But let's skip ahead a bit to World War One. He fought in World War One. You describe him as a person who actually loved war. What was his experience like? It was it's such an intriguing story because he went to, you know, he went to Eton and he went to Oxford and he somehow never fit in 
as much as he would have liked in either place. He was bullied at Eton. And I think in the trenches when he went there, he finally found the kind of camaraderie that he was always looking for. I think the men looked up to him. He achieved a position of leadership that he quite enjoyed. And I think he saw class divisions and barriers melt away to a certain extent in the trenches. And all of this sort of really brought the war alive for him and made it sort of an enjoyable experience insofar as it can be. I think it was only much later that he realized sort of the the dreadful consequences of it. And maybe even while he was fighting, some of his poems seemed to betray a few of the horrors that he must have felt at some point. But he came away, typical Haldane, extremely bombastic and sort of bragging about how he'd enjoyed the entire experience. He was wounded twice, first on the Western Front, and then in Mesopotamia, and that sort of put an end to his war experiences. He came back after that and just went straight back into the sciences. He eventually, as you said earlier, became a very staunch communist. Were his politics part of his upbringing? Did they develop at war? When did he become so political? My theory is that it has a lot to do with his boyhood and his father. I think the more he saw of how the working classes of Britain lived, the further and further to the left he started to drift. It is for certainly true of his time in the trenches. And, you know, even when he came back after the First World War, he was already left of center, as we might put it. And I think that increased more and more as uh, he accrued further life experiences. He went to the Soviet Union just once in 1928 for a month. And uh, despite all the other things that he might have seen that might have put him off Stalin, he chose to see the kind of emphasis and monetary support that was being given to the sciences in Moscow at the time. And he came back wholly convinced that uh, uh, the best kind of society for a scientist to live in was a Soviet or a communist kind of society. He married a woman who was a communist herself, and that further entrenched him in the cause. So I think it's it's a combination of a lot of these things that drove him further and further towards the cause of communism. He also ended up volunteering to participate in the Spanish Civil War. Did that, I'm assuming, further further his communist convictions? I think so. Maybe he went there because of his communist convictions, because he was already sort of sternly anti-fascist in the 1930s. He was issuing stern warnings about Nazi Germany by the mid-30s. And, you know, the minute Franco and his fascists started up this war, and the minute Germany weighed in on Franco's side, he knew exactly where his, his field is laid. And so he went three times to Spain. Each time he went for a couple of months, he tried as much as possible to help the Republicans. He helped them with protecting against gas attacks. He swanned around the front with Ernest Hemingway and Martha Gellhorn. He really seems to have had, again, sort of quite a fine time of it, except a couple of times he was almost killed. And I think one of these times he actually did realize that, you know, it was too soon to die. He had too much work to do. And for the first time, I think, in his life, the prospect of death scared him. You mentioned earlier that he had written World War I poetry, but he also wrote a lot of other things. He was a, a frequent commentator in newspapers. Was this all political writing or did he write about the scientific work he did? And and did it ever get in the way of his scientific career? Initially, you know, when he first started out as a scientist, he used to scoff at scientists who wrote for the lay audience. He thought that they would it would turn them into quacks. But I think, you know, when he started doing it and he clearly had such a gift for it, he was such an elegant writer the measure of fame that it brought him, I think he really started to enjoy that and he continued to do it. Most of his writing was about science, not just his own, but any kind of scientific research or you know news that was out there. He would often tie it to sort of everyday events and he would deduce, for example, how hormones work in the human body from a salacious news report about a football team ingesting monkey glands to further their performance. And then Sometimes towards the end, he would leave in some of these columns with a little bit of political instruction. Sometimes it was done well. Most of the times it was done quite ham-handedly. But he was always sincere about this. And I think he thought that you could sort of spoon feed people their communism or their socialism with the sweetness of sort of a little bit of scientific instruction. Did his politics inform his scientific pursuits? 
I think in that respect, he managed to keep them quite separate. I mean, there's been a lot of debate about this in holiday in academia as it were. But I think he managed to sort of put a firewall between his politics and his science insofar as his politics impacted his own science, his own work. The one big exception, of course, is the one that I talk about quite extensively in the book, which is his decision to support the Soviet agronomist called Trofim Lysenko, whose views on agriculture and genetics were quite, quite wrong. But I think because of political loyalty, loyalty to the Communist Party, he chose to really put his foot out there and and defend Lysenko for a good number of years before he backtracked. You've written two previous books, both of them about South Asia, one about the Sri Lankan War, another one about the Indian coast. This is a really different book. What inspired you to write about Haldane? There is a South Asian connection here as well. Haldane spent the last seven years of his life in India. He got fed up with what he called the Western world, and in particular England. He yearned to live in a country that had some kind of socialist spine to it. And so he moved to India in 1957. So there is that connection. And I kind of started reading about him only because I I learned that he had spent all this time in India. But then, you know, the truth is you can read the barest outlines of Haldane's life. You can read about his time in the trenches and his time in the Civil War and his time you know, fighting authority figures all the way through, all the way through, and, you know, his ugly divorce and all of this stuff. And you, it's impossible to not get fascinated by the arc of this life. I mean, it's so rich and so detailed. And he seems to be such a unique and individualistic character with so much to tell us about the world that we live in. It was almost, I mean, the minute I read the first book about him, I was hooked and I knew that I had to write about him. What were the challenges of writing this book? Because it is very different from the the other books that you did about writing a biography and, and what kind of research were you able to do? It is. I mean, I'm a journalist. And, and so my first instinct is to always do interviews and look around me and describe what I see. This was the first extended work that I'd done where I had to rely on archives to build essentially a vivid picture of a world that was bygone. And I had nobody to interview. Haldane himself had no children. There were there are very few people around today who knew him. And so all of this, you know, the scenes, as, uh, as narrative journalists like to put it, all of these scenes had to be reconstructed from textual sources. And I'd never done this before. I mean, I had no idea how to how to make a scene come alive on a page if I was only reading about various details of it in, in other texts. So I think that was probably my biggest challenge. I mean, I, I struggled for a long time to get the voice right to make sure I could reconstruct these these locations and these episodes that he lived through to make sure that it was as accessible as possible to a reader who isn't a scientist. There is still today, obviously, maybe even more so, I don't know, a kind of uneasy relationship between science and politics. Were there any sort of I hate to make it so simple, but lessons or connections that you can draw from Haldane's experience and that intersection and the pursuit of science today. When I first started working on the book, I started talking to you know other friends of mine who were scientists, and they all you know sort of unique almost to a man and or woman said that in the years since Haldane had died, scientists themselves hadn't quite been as political as they might have been. And there's a number of reasons for this. You know, science itself is more specialized. Scientists don't study the humanities as much as they used to. Funding is very often a reason. If your funding is coming from a government body or a corporation, you choose not to speak up against these bodies. And so, you know, there's a number of reasons as to why this this is the case. I mean, except perhaps except for climate change, I think in most cases, scientists were quite happy to sort of whisper within their ivory towers rather than speak out loudly in the public sphere. But as I was working on the book, that actually started to change. And a lot of this had to do with the election in 2016, the subsequent marches for science that has that have happened all over the world. The realization, increasingly, that if scientists choose to stay silent, the results of their work will be manipulated by people who have a vested interest to do so. And the only way, you know, the results of scientific work can be protected and used wisely is if scientists themselves choose to speak up and to defend its precepts. So I think that has started happening a lot over the last four years. And I think Haldane would have found this extremely interesting time to live in. I mean, there's no doubt that he would be on 
MSNBC almost every day trying to speak up for, you know, more testing in the U.S. or speak up against hydroxychloroquine use or drinking bleach or any of these other things that we've seen in the news over the last few months. Well, since we don't have him on MSNBC, we do have him in this book. It's just such a fascinating story. The book, again, is called A Dominant Character, The Radical Science and Restless Politics of J.B.S. Haldane by Samanth Subramanian. Samanth, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. Patrick Svensson joins us now. He is the author of the international bestseller, The Book of Eels. Patrick, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So you are joining me from Malmo, Sweden, where your regular day job is as an arts and cultural journalist. What's it like right now, given the pandemic? Are the arts still up and running at all in Sweden? No, they are not. And I'm I'm actually on a leave right now, but uh, there's no like concerts, no theater, uh, no movie theaters open. So it's it's very different. Yeah. All right. Well, given the fact that normally that's what you do for a living, right, about arts and culture, um, what made you decide, of all things, for your first book to write a book about eels? It's not the obvious path. No, no, of course. You know, because basically because it's a remarkable animal, and the the scientific history of the surrounding the eel is is a really great story, and also because I have this you know personal connection to the eels because I grew up fishing for eels with my father down by a small stream here in Sweden, uh, late summer nights, just me and him, and and those those nights together with my father. And the eels are are kind of very important, kind of magical memories for me. I should say, for those who have not yet read this book, and it is a huge international bestseller, right? It's in about 40 languages? Yeah, it's 33, I think. 33. Okay, you'll get to 40. That the book is as much about, it seems, your father and your relationship with him growing up, fishing for eels. He was a a paver. It also weaves in a lot of philosophy and, and nature writing. And did that approach emerge from the beginning that you wanted to make this not simply a, a sort of zoology book, but really weave in a number of other elements into the story? No, it was kind of a strange process for me. I, I started writing this book as I had an idea of writing a like a popular science book uh, book about eels, but I wanted to to write about my own experience experience of the eel too to just get closer to the subject in a way and and then i realized that those two stories my own personal story and the story of the eel and the science kind of reflected each other it become became uh, like mirrors for each other and and uh, and there also like a philosophical approach uh, emerged from this when the, I write about the eel and the eel has this need to always return to the place it comes from. Every eel is born in the Sagasso Sea and they always have to return there at the end of their life. I had to try to write myself to my own Sagasso Sea in a way, I guess, back to my origin. Let's start with the parts about your father. The book, as you mentioned earlier, is, it's it's really bookended by your early childhood experiences with him. And then I hope I'm not revealing the ending too much, but it, with his death. And of course, it reminded me as a reader, and I think other readers have brought up this analogy of Helen McDonald's book, H is for Hawk, which is also about grieving for a father and, and an animal. And did you read that book before you started working on this? Was that in any way an inspiration or were you trying to do something, I assume, very different? I mean, an eel is, is quite a different creature from a hawk. I Actually, I didn't read it, but I heard a lot of people talk about it. And I read it uh, now and it's a, an amazing book, of course. I think there's something in the, in, in the relationship with the parent that when it has to do with one specific thing you do together with the parent, that thing, and for me it was eel fishing, that becomes very important 
But let's talk about eels specifically because they are fascinating creatures and there's still a lot of mysteries around them. I want to start with the metamorphosis of the eel because there are a number of ways of referring to them. Glass eels, yellow eels, silver eels. This is all the same creature. What is the life cycle of an eel? Well, it's every eel is born in the Sagasso Sea, both the European and the American eel. And uh, the, the first stage, there are small larvae that's called the leptocephalus larva. And then it drifts with the uh, ocean currents to, to uh, either uh, America or Europe. And uh, it transforms, it changes uh, shape, and it becomes the glass eel that is totally transparent. And then it becomes the yellow eel, and it lives its life as a yellow eel in, in fresh water. And it could be a very long life. There's eels that are has been over 80 years old. But then at some point in their life, they have to go back to the Sagasso Sea. And then they change into the silver eel. And they travel all the way across the Atlantic back to the Sag- Sagasso Sea, where they breed for the first time and then they die. And that's the life cycle. And, and, and it's a great story in itself. And when before they turn into the glass eel, you refer to them in the book, or at least in the English translation, as a willow leaf. What does that look like? I'm assuming it resembles the leaf of a willow tree. Yes, it, it does. And it, 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 it's described as uh, looking like a willow leaf in, in uh, literature. It's not just me. That was one of the strange things that happened in the writing process, because I, when I was writing about my early memories from fishing with my father, I remember this place from memory, you know, down by the stream, late summer nights. And I saw, one of the things I saw from memory was a big willow tree. And I described this tree. And then when I was researching about the eel and the science, I came across this uh, uh, description of the the small eel larva looking like a willow leaf. And it, it was in that moment that I understood that I also had to use the willow leaf as a kind of a metaphor because it was uh, something happened there, I guess, with with the story. One of the things that fascinated me is that, as you mentioned, all eels are born seemingly in the Sargasso Sea and half of them go off to America and the other, or I don't know if it's half and half, but a certain number of them go to Europe. But they're actually two different species. And then there's also Japanese eels that sort of make a similar migration. What differentiates them? And are they interchangeable and they develop into different species as they go through these metamorphoses? What do we know and not know? No, they're different species. They are, but they are very similar. Both the American and the European eel, they get caught in the the Gulf uh, uh, stream, you know, the Gulf Ocean current. But then suddenly the American eels uh, leave the leave the current and turns west, and their European eels travel eastward to to Europe, and that's just how how do they know where to go? It's a, it's a, those small mysteries that surround the eels. Our knowledge of eels in Europe, at least, and in the Western world, probably begins with Aristotle, who people probably don't associate with eels. But you write about his study of them. What did he? get right and wrong about the eel? Mostly this is, a, it's a book about science and science history and how science works. And I, I, I found out that if you don't just ask the question, what do we know about the eel? But you ask the question, how do we know it? Then this, this scientific history is full of great stories. And it's, that's when you find the story about Aristotle trying to understand the eel more than 2000 years ago. And he, he studied the eel and, and uh, he tried to explain how the eel breeds and if there are sexual differences in the eel. But he couldn't find any, uh, you know, sexual organs in the eel because the eel don't get their sexual organs until the last stage of their life. So Aristotle, he, he came to the conclusion that the eels don't breed at all, that they are actually born out of nothing. They're born out of mud, he said. That's life that uh, life that uh, starts out of nothing, you know, and and this uh, this was the, like the first time when the what the in scientific history they they talk about the eel question, and that's been a, a question that's been uh, very hard to to solve and to answer, 
and uh, it uh, it has to do with how do the, does the eel breed? Are there sexual differences? Are there males and females? And all all of this has been very hard for science to to explain, and up until uh, today, actually. I mean, it's almost comical, but. Sigmund Freud became interested in the sex organs of eels. Can you talk a little bit about his experience trying to figure out this this eel question around sex and, and reproduction? Yeah, Sigmund Freud, he was 19 years old and studying in natural science, and he thought that he was going to be the one to answer the eel question. And he was going to prove that they have sexual differences, that there are males and females. So he went to uh, Trieste. And he uh, was actually, he was going to find a male eel with developed sexual organs. So he, he was going to find an eel testicle. And he uh, studied hundreds of eels in a laboratory in Trieste and, and actually failed. His first like science work was trying to explain this, the sexual sexuality of a fish and he failed. And uh, I, I guess it might have something to do with his later career, uh, trying to understand the human sexuality instead, because it was uh, probably simpler. Every debut author wants their first book to do well. But I think few people expect their first book out the gate to be a massive international bestseller. I mean, I'm not surprised as a reader because it's completely engrossing. But what was your reaction? I mean, were you surprised? I'm assuming it started off as a, as a big success in Sweden before it then, you know, swept the rest of the world. Yeah, I have to say I was very surprised. It, it's my first book. And when you write a book about eels, you, you don't expect this to happen, of course. And uh, I was under the impression that I was writing a rather... Uh, nerdy uh, book about a very small subject that fascinated me and maybe some other people but i was almost shocked by the interest but of course it's it's mainly a book about about human uh, about mankind and about uh, this urge to understand the world around us and there's so much that we still don't understand about the eels. You end on this disturbing fact that eels are disappearing, as are so many other creatures on the planet, as we are perhaps in the midst of this big sixth mass extinction. Why should we care about eels going away in particular? I'm writing about the eel uh, being almost extinct. The scientists are calculating that the uh, the eel uh, population has gone down by more than uh, 95% since the 70s. And uh, I wanted also to use the eel, the disappearing eel, to talk about this much bigger uh, issue about what they call the sixth uh, mass extinction. And the, that uh, there are uh, thousands of species that are, are disappearing. And, and uh, this is, a, of course, a very big problem. It's going to change the whole world as we know it. And uh, of course, we have to, to care about this and, and we have to learn more about it and we have to be interested in it. And it, Because it's not only about the eel, it's about the, the world as we know it. One other aspect of loss here is not just, you know, very obviously about the climate and about the ecosystem and about the health of our planet, but also about culture. Because you write a lot about, not just in Sweden, but in Japan and other areas of Europe, these sort of subcultures of people who fish for eels, the different ways of eating them it didn't sound totally appetizing. It doesn't sound like you found it totally appetizing either. But nonetheless, there's this other loss. And I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about Sweden in particular and about the culture around eel fishing there. And has that just completely come to an end? Yeah, in parts of Sweden, eel fishing has been very important, and there there are traditions, and there's a whole way of living, and and there they have uh, affected the language and and uh, the culture. But of course, this is disappearing because the eel is disappearing, and it's forbidden to fish for eels in Sweden now. But there are some professional fisher eel fishers that have special allowance to fish for eels, but. It's disappearing, and, and uh, uh, it, it, of course it has to, to disappear because we have to stop eating eels. But uh, it's a loss. It, it, it's a loss of tradition, and it's a loss of, of uh, knowledge and uh, culture. 
I think your book is going to have a lot more people caring about this. It's such a good book. So deservedly a bestseller. Patrick, really appreciate your taking the time to talk to me. Thank you very much for having me. Patrick Svensson is the author of The Book of Eels. Our critics, Pearl Sagal and Jennifer Salai, join us now. Hey, guys. Hi, Pamela. Hey, Pamela. Let's start with you, Pearl. What did you review this week? I reviewed a memoir called The Erratics by a writer named Vicky Lavoux Harvey. I'm necessarily pronouncing her name in French. I don't know if she pronounces it with that <laughs> accent, but there, we're, we're going for it. She was born in Canada and as soon as she could, escaped her incredibly dysfunctional family, in particular her very monstrous mother, and moved to France and moved to Australia. And she's written a book at the age of 77, it's the first book, about her family, and in particular her mother, and growing up with this woman who had this incredible talent for distorting reality. And there are actually a number of memoirs like this, you know, every year. And I have a soft spot for like the mean mommy memoir, but I picked this up and, you know, she's one of those writers that it doesn't really matter what she would choose to write about. She just has such a strong and interesting style. And the book itself is, it's so strange because as she's describing her childhood and she's describing her family, anytime you think she's going to burrow into into psychology and into personality, she moves to talking about nature, geology. And it's, it's the strangest thing. And I was writing the review, I was like, is this a problem with the book or is this something very integral to its style and and she's trying to tell us something that I look away from this person I look out the window so part of the thing I was trying to write about in my review is that moment when you find something that you're not sure is something that is a flaw but is it actually something very exciting and original so a lovely book I had some quibbles with it but but overall uh, in this genre something that felt original and and pretty moving You know, I too, I think, as you know, I think we've talked about this, have a real weakness for this sub-sub-genre of of memoirs of, you know, terrible parents in general. But yes, maybe mothers even more so. And I'm wondering, like, what do you consider to be the masterworks of this particular sub-genre? I love Jeanette Winterson's Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal. I love all of Jenny Diskey's writing about her mother. I like Alison Bechdel's book, Are You My Mother? I mean, there's so many, and I feel like I've read them all and feeling vastly smug about my own parenting. I don't know what's going on with my love <laughs> genre. I, think. I feel so in control. I feel so kind. I think the real reason I love it is that it's still, no matter how old the writer is, and I was very struck by the fact that she's 77, it still feels taboo. It still feels taboo to write about the mother and it, it in this sort of way. And I think that there is something about the way that she even skirts writing about the mother that almost feels like she can't look directly at the sun. She can look kind of around it and every now and again, she can approach it, but it just feels very, it feels, it feels forbidden. And I think that that gives an interesting charge to the prose. You know, one of the things I was curious about, because you have this amazing phrase, I think, where you talk about how the author seems almost afraid to bring her mother back into the narrative after a certain point because of her contaminating charm. Does she look at, why her mother was that way at all? Or is it just totally elided? It's so interesting. If she doesn't, and most of these books, you know, do try to say, well, I had this mother, but who made her? You know, something must have happened. What is this? What is the source of the cruelty? What is the provenance? She doesn't ask any questions. She doesn't try to diagnose her mother. She just writes about her mother, as I write in the review, like something, like an act of nature that had to be survived. And she's trying to, I think, I think in the prose, trying to show you the costs of the survival become interesting to her, the means of survival, the sensibility. And uh, yeah, it's, it it really does something different. And I think, you know, in a strange way, as you're reading it, it almost can make you feel a little bit like the child because the child can't fully understand the sources of the cruelty, right? The child just has to, just sees the signs and the symptoms and it's just an interesting choice. It's for me a little unsatisfying. For me, I, I'm, I'm very curious about how people try to understand these questions and find these lineages. But again, you know, it's it's personal, it's idiosyncratic, and it does create a very different sort of character without a backstory. Jen, what did you review this week? So I recently reviewed a book called Time of the Magicians by a German philosopher and writer named Wolfram Eilenberger. And so what it is is it's one of these group portraits, and this time it's of four philosophers during a very turbulent time. 
during a turbulent decade, 1919 to 1929. And he looks at how they responded to this moment of crisis and how they really transformed the discipline of philosophy. So the four people he looks at are Martin Heidegger, Ludwig Wittgenstein, Walter Benjamin and Ernst Cassirer. And, you know, they're all, all four of them are recognizing that something horrible obviously has taken place. It's after the end of World War I. There's hyperinflation in Germany. There's food shortages. And on top of that, there is also this crisis of meaning in terms of their discipline, you know, because the old ways of thinking were really developed in a previous world where, you know, this was before Einstein's theory of relativity had really upended the way people saw things at the beginning of the 20th century, before Freud. And so they're looking at how these changes to how we understand what a human being is, what a human being can know, what that means for the way that one not only looks at the world, but also the way in which one might live in the world. And so I thought that this book was just really took a light touch to deep questions without oversimplifying them, which I thought was really interesting. And there have been a number of these group portraits or group bi- biographies, especially of philosophers, I feel like in a way it's sort of a discipline that lends itself well to this. You know, there was Sarah Bakewell's at the Existentialist Cafe from a few years ago, a couple of decades ago, I think it was Louis Menand's The Metaphysical Club. This one, I think it's really generative, I think, to look at the way in which four very different people responded to a similar situation, responded to the same moment, and came out of it looking at it with perspectives that in some ways overlapped and in some ways were totally different and totally divergent. And I think it also sort of raised raised this question, which I think is really relevant today, which is how, you know, how do you respond to a crisis in a way that not only diagnoses the problem, but also finds a way to move forward? And they did it in very different ways, all of them unsatisfactory, some of them (laughs) really upsetting and disturbing. You know, for example, I mean, Martin Heidegger, I guess, is the most obvious example. You know, after the book ends, he becomes a Nazi. He's a member of the Nazi party. And somebody like Ernst Cassirer, who had to flee Germany the same, at the same month, actually, that Heidegger became a Nazi, I mean, he fled Germany realizing that he himself had totally underestimated the crisis that was taking place. So, I I really felt like there was a way in which, even if people are familiar with the lives of these philosophers, perhaps not all of them, they'll also sort of learn the way and, you know, the ways that these ideas interact. And, you know, it really adds up to something that I thought was really resonant. It sounds fascinating. Yes. I should also add that one of the really interesting things is this role of language and the role that language plays in all of their philosophies. And, Also, the book itself was translated from the German by Sean Whiteside, who I think translates from several different languages, not just from German into English, but also French. And, you know, the role that language plays, the role that language plays in how we conceptualize and carve up the world that we live in, how we understand it, what we overlook as well, I thought was something that the author really gets at, but he also does it narratively. So it's always embedded in the story. And so he does talk about the ideas. He does look deeply into the ideas, but at the same time, he also shows how they're actually connected to something that's really vital, immediate, and probably for many people familiar, I think, which I think is also very helpful. And it's it's also an entertaining book, which I think is hard to do when you're dealing with four very difficult thinkers. Can I ask a really basic question about translation? Of course. I have this imaginary hierarchy in my brain that's probably totally wrong. That is, the most difficult thing to translate would be poetry followed by fiction and then followed by nonfiction because maybe the precision of the language isn't quite as important in nonfiction. But you could feel free to blow that apart. I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are. I think it is an interesting question. And 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 the role of poetry is actually something that comes up in this book and the role of translation and, and how it works. Because I think, yeah, there is that question of how do you translate something that's intended to sort of connect to all these connotations and implications in the original language that 
it might not do in the same way when you translate it into another language. And, you know, I do think that the best translators obviously are aware of that and try to do it in such a way where maybe the effect or the experience of reading the words, maybe it can't be identical, but it it can have some sort of analogy in some way. I mean, it's it's always going to be inexact, but, you know, for nonfiction, I, I also think it's interesting because it's, you know, Heidegger, you know, he came up with all these neologisms in German, which we then translate into, you know, words with hyphens in English to convey what he meant, like being toward death. He's somebody that I think even if you have the best translator into English, it's still dense. There's a lot going on. There's there's a lot of implications in it. So I, I, I guess it really depends on the writer. I was just, just listening very rapt. <laughs> <laughs> one one thought I do have is I also really like the point that you made about philosophers being very being very good subjects for group biographies. And I was also thinking about Jim Holt, who often frequently oh, right. writes about conversations between philosophers, friendship between philosophers, and that there's something about this work that we tend to think of as very solitary and monkish. Yes actually exists in a very different context. And I know even in my own reading, I'm always surprised to find like how gregarious they were and uh, even in their letters, but like how much it seemed to be, it's not a collective effort, but something that the ideas get sharpened together, you know, and tested in conversation, as you say, and it is, it does have to do with language. So maybe, maybe that's one particular reason. I'm not sure. Oh yeah. No, that's an interesting way of thinking about it, I think, because also this notion of how you communicate with one another in a medium that many of these philosophers thought was very much imperfect. You know, how do you convey your ideas in such a way? What do they mean, not only to you yourself, but also to somebody else who maybe brings his or ho- her own experiences to it? I think it's it's sort of a fascinating question. And I think that that's absolutely right. These conversations between these thinkers, I mean, you really do see how ideas are not just sort of the separate realm that they're so much tethered to what's going on, even the ones that seem the most abstract. So I really, I really enjoyed this one. You've left me in a dark place contemplating (sighs) like the future Slack chats between, you know, the philosophers of today, like (laughs) the Slack channel where they all convene. I'm sure they're talking about crisis right now. I think that's a big, (laughs) I think that's a big subject. All right, Jen, Parl, a pleasure as always. Thanks. Thank you. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. And you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. I write back, not right away, but I do. The Book Review Podcast is produced by the great Pedro Rosado from Headstepper Media with a major assist from my colleague, John Williams. Thanks for listening. For The New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Pamela Paul.